Okay, we're about halfway through with my material. We've talked about the person and power of the Holy Spirit a little bit, about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We talk about the Holy Spirit being given to those that obey in this hour. And then in the final section, the spirit we've been given is no cowardly spirit, no timid spirit. So that's what we're headed into now. Let me read to you from the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 5, verse 27 and following. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so too is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The Holy Spirit is given to those that obey God. Conversely, the Holy Spirit is not given to those who disobey. In order to understand almost anything, it's good to go back to the beginning. And so for us, the beginning in scriptures, the book of Genesis. And you remember chapter one and two of Genesis concerns creation. The summary of which is uh, God called everything into being out of nothing. Uh, two classes of being, being itself, the creator, and everything else, creation. After God had created everything, he declared it to be good, very good. That's Genesis 1 and 2. The third chapter of the book of Genesis concerns the fall of man. And, and you remember the account of of Genesis, and uh, don't be overly influenced by uh, uh, some of the biblical commentary that would tell you that, oh, well, that's not really true, and, and that's uh, somehow uh, uh, metaphorical or whatever. No, it, it, it's useful and substantially true in principle. But what happened? Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, Adam and Eve were in the garden <laughs> and, and uh, the serpent came along. Now the serpent, scripture tells us, was the most cunning, another translation is subtle the most subtle of all the creatures the Lord God had created. And he says to Eve, so God has commanded you not to partake of the fruit of the trees in the garden? And the substance of Eve's answer was, well, no, God told us we can partake or eat of of the fruit of all the trees in the garden. Human freedom is very broad. However, we cannot eat of the fruit of the tree in the center of the garden or even touch it lest we die. 
That was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The devil's response, ah, surely you don't believe God. No, he just doesn't want you to be like him. Go ahead, disobey, and you will become like gods, knowing good and evil. Now, I'm paraphrasing and interpreting, but that's the substance of it. You will become like gods. God doesn't want you to partake of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because if you do, he knows you will become like him. You will be like gods, knowing good and evil subjectively and arbitrarily without reference to God. Well, it looked good. It sounded plausible. And so Eve disobeyed God. Uh, what happened? Exactly what God said would happen. You are not to partake of that fruit or even touch it lest you die. And at that instant, as the result of that disobedience, death entered creation. Let's look at that for a moment. The genesis of all sin is pride. And by pride, I, I you know, you, language is important. Um, and you have to be careful with language. We have what I would call a crisis of language today. Uh, you know, words like love. Uh, in English, we have one word, love. Um, you know, we're in a hockey arena, so I had to have a hot dog earlier. Right? You can't go to a baseball game or any, you know, a hockey game. You've got to have a hot dog. So, okay. I can say, oh, I love hot dogs. You know, I love my dog, Greta. I love, uh, you know, my sister. I love my brother. I love the Holy Father. I love God. One word, love. Does it, did they all mean the same thing? Of course not. There are radical differences, gradations in those words. Now, in Koine Greek, the language in which the New Testament is written, there are three, probably four words for love. You know, three of them you're familiar with. Uh, philia, right? Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, philia, like a, a brotherly love, a fraternal love, right? And, and, and you've got uh, a, another word, eros, which, which would indicate romantic kind of love. And then you've got agape. All three of them, they, they indicate a, a certain love. In English, we have one word, love. But in the language of the New Testament, you've got at least three. And they mean different things. You have to be careful with language. Yeah, there, there's a terrible abuse of language today, and people are easily fooled. So be careful with language. But how did sin enter the universe? Well, it was disobedience. Death entered the universe through disobedience. But what caused the disobedience? Pride. And I don't mean the pride that you might have. I have pride in my work. I'm proud of my children. Uh, that's fine. That's a different thing. Uh, what, we're, what we're talking about uh, is that self-centered, egotistical kind of, uh, of pride. Uh, hubris would be the Greek word that indicated that, hubris. That, that's that egotistical, self-centered pride. Uh, basically, it's a statement that seeks to exalt the creature above the creator. That's what caused the disobedience in the beginning. Hubris, resulting in disobedience, resulting in death. And there you have the prototype for all evil from the beginning forward. The Holy Spirit is given to those that obey God. No 
obedience to God and his church, the authentic teaching of the church, no obedience, no life. Pride, disobedience, death. The antidote, humility, obedience, life. And it's that simple. Theology is the highest of all sciences because it's basically the, the study of God and all things as they relate to God. It's not rocket science, folks. You know, God, God it designed it for simple people like me, you know, fishermen like the apostles. You know, if you ever listen to a sermon, homily, lecture from a supposedly educated person, priest, theologian, whatever, and you sit there and wonder what the guy said, it's probably good that you don't know what he said. If it's that confusing. I remember once a, a story that uh, <laughs> the great Archbishop Fulton Sheen told. Uh, he was a very, very erudite man, a very educated man, a very holy man. And uh, he, he told this story. When, when he was a newly ordained priest, he was in England for a while, in London, and he was giving uh, a theology class to some deacons. And he was uh, holding forth on theandric actions. Now, uh, that, that, that word, it don't be confused by Greek words or long words. It, it merely indicates an action of the God-man, Jesus Christ, from two Greek words, the word for God, the word for man. A theandric action is an action of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ, acting through his human nature. So Bishop Jean was giving a lecture on theandric actions. And it was early in his career. And having the best education the church could provide, a, a brilliant philosopher and theologian, uh, he studied at, at Louvain in Belgium, um, had great honors, academic honors. <clears throat> but he, he was, in a, in a sense, still a, a little bit immature and maybe a little bit impressed with all the knowledge and erudition that he had. So he was holding forth, and at the end, one of the deacons came up to him, to him and said, oh, oh, Dr. Sheehan, positively brilliant, positively brilliant. Bishop Sheen responded, oh yeah, what did I say? And the deacon said, well, I don't quite know. And Bishop Sheen said, neither do I. And, and, and there's, a, there's a, a certain truth in that. Th this is not complicated stuff. Yes, it's a high science, theology, our faith, but, but don't be confused by it. This is, this is something very important. Don't ever forget it. Genesis. Creation. Good, very good. The fall. Pride. Disobedience. Death. The antidote. Humility, obedience, life. I just described the Lord Jesus Christ. He was humble. Can you imagine God as humble? Humility enables obedience, which leads to life. Hubris, that self-centered egotistical pride, facilitates disobedience. And that leads to death. And most importantly, what the book of Revelation calls the second death. That's hell. Remember it. And cultivate humility. Now, you, you might, and once again, words. I've always tried to teach principles. You know the old adage, you can give a man a fish and feed him for a day, or you can teach him how to fish, and he can feed himself for a lifetime. 
If you learn principles, you can solve all kinds of problems. So know the basic principles. Humility, obedience, life. Pride, disobedience, death. And that's really the summation of redemption theology. Now, look at the world. Look at the church. Look, look at what's happened in the last half a century. Somehow, things got out of control. In my lifetime, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little over 60. I'm not quite ancient, but I've seen a little bit. In that time, from when I was a boy to now, and you know it as well as I do, a lot of you are, are as old or older than I am, you've seen it. I alluded to it before about, you know, kids disrespecting their parents. I mean, how does a kid curse his mother out in the grocery store? Honestly, you know, and, and just when you think you've made progress in the spiritual life, th this kid was so obnoxious, about 15, 16 years old, and he used language that was off on, with his mother. I almost grabbed him up by his scruffy, skinny little neck. I wanted to. I didn't, of course. But, you know, you think, how do you talk to your mother that way? That's what society not always, but frequently, has cultivated. Lack of respect, lack of obedience to authority. Uh, you know, I told you before, even if you disagree uh, with authority, let's say authority in the church, okay? You don't agree with, with, with what a bishop somewhere says, or a pastor, or a theologian. First of all, know what you're talking about. You know, I, I have seen hundreds of times people like fly off the handle and they think, oh, they did this, that, or the other thing, and this, that, and they don't really have a clue what they're talking about. They think they know, but they don't. But sometimes, you know, the person in authority is wrong. I, I've experienced it. I've seen it. I've told you about some of my experiences. Always be respectful. It isn't smart to disrespect people, even if they're wrong. I'm not saying you have to agree with them. Be respectful. You will get nowhere by disrespecting people, whether in, a, in the church in authority or in the secular world in authority. You, you, you just don't, you know, if, if you wanted to make headway with me on some point, and you came up to me, as has happened at times, and started screaming in my face, verbally beating on me, you have no chance. None. None. On the other hand, if you're polite, kind, patient, I'll listen to you. If you're not, I immediately discount you. And it's the same thing with, with any authority. Be respectful. You, how, you know what? Today, and I see this every day, and I admit some of our, our situation in places in the secular order and, and, and even in the church sometimes, it, it can be very distressing. I know. I sympathize with your distress. I sympathize with the discouragement, the disillusionment. Don't use that as an excuse to lose it. You know, don't start bashing people in authority. You know what that comes from? Arrogance. And good people can be arrogant too, you know. Not just bad people. Humility enables you, capacitates you, empowers you to be obedient. Now, I'm not saying you have to be obedient to evil or error. Please don't get me wrong. You know, one of the things that comforts me and will comfort me right to the end is that 
When I check out, God willing, I'll be able to be at peace on my deathbed because I helped form divisions of good, solid Catholics. Listen, I have, I, I've got recon marine elderly ladies who strike fear in the hearts of evil. Lots of them. Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, people that have learned their faith. That's a force to be reckoned with. The truth is a sword, the two-edged sword of the word of God. And that's what we fight evil with. That's the only way society will, will change. But always remember, humility, obedience, life. And don't be duped by the enemy. You know, pride essentially is a lie. Now you remember Jesus referred to the devil as a liar and the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning. Note the link between lies and death. Pride is the consummate, quintessential, primordial lie. And what, what is pride? What, what is that kind of pride I'm talking about? That is a, a statement which basically seeks to exalt the creature above the creator. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. I acknowledge who God is. God's the creator. He's all powerful. I'm a creature. I'm a speck of dust in the cosmos. God loves the speck. That's the truth. That's humility. Humility is not walking around with your head down saying, I'm no good. I'm no good. You may darn well be not very good, but that's not humility. Humility is the acknowledgement of truth. God's the creator. God's the all-powerful. God's the all-knowing, the all-merciful. I'm just a little speck, a little creature. But God has given me gifts. God loves me. That's the truth. That's authentic humility. That will capacitate you to be obedient to legitimate authority, and that will lead to life, especially eternal life. I remember once when I was a seminarian, I, I had a, a mentor who was a Benedictine prior, uh, a very holy man, a very educated man, a, a great scholar. And I remember being very, very distressed uh, at the, what I was seeing in the church. I was seeing um, a lot of disobedience to the Holy Father. I was seeing um, uh, rejection of church teaching in certain areas, especially life areas. And I was very upset about this. And I said uh, to my friend, a, a priest, the superior of this monastery, I, I, I said, Father, but, but I'm, I'm very upset about this and, and I'm very disturbed. He says, I know, you're upset and disturbed about a lot of things. It's not helpful. You're not wrong. You know, objectively, you're right on the, on the, on the issues, on the truth. But you're insecure. Remember something. No one can take your faith away from you. No one can take your faith. Don't be so insecure. You know, no theologian can do that. No priest, no bishop. Nobody can do that. Your, your faith is a pearl of great price. It's yours. God's given it to you. And so don't worry so much. You know, especially in the last several months, you know, I, I, I would say I've seen it much more 
in, the, in, in our country than I have in the church in recent months. But, you know, a lot of people are, are upset about, you know, the way things are going uh, politically and so forth. I have never seen so much fear in my life. And I understand. But stop it. God is in charge. There's still a God in heaven. You know, th th this stuff's all going to pass away. Th th believe me. Believe me. My mom's right. We know the last chapter of the book. I don't, I don't you know, whoever the, the President of the United States is, the Congress, the Supreme Court members, the appointees, I understand there are problems. I don't disagree with you. All I'm saying is, pray. I'm, I'm quoting Padre Pio here, St. Pio. Pray and don't worry. God's in charge. Really, really. Have confidence. You know, life it's like a, a, a boxing match, a football game, a war. You know, on a, you might have a, a, you know, a, a good round in, in the fight. You might have a, a bad quarter in the football game. But imagine if ahead of time you knew the ultimate outcome. You're going to win. You're going to win the game. You're going to win the fight. How much more confidence you would have. And no matter how dark it got all around you, no matter how distressing, uh, no matter how evil it seemed that society or politicians or whatever, you know how it's going to end. So fight the good fight, but don't worry so much. I have seen a terrible amount of fear and worry, and it's bad, it's negative. It's, it's counterproductive. Every military commander knows very well that lack of morale is the kiss of death in his unit, in his army. You don't allow that. You just flat can't allow that. Let me tell you a fact. In general, there's lousy morale in the Catholic Church. There's horrible morale in the priesthood in general. You can't hardly sit down most places in the church in North America with your brother priest unless you make a conscious, concerted effort to never talk about two things, religion or politics. Really? Really? Now, I don't have those occasions uh, anymore. I, I was speaking to the bishop earlier, and, and I had not met the, the bishop, and um, I, I was very impressed by his humility and his kindness. And, and uh, you know, I, I, he, bishops are consumed by so many things. I feel so sorry for them. They have to run from one function to the next. They're always busy. This parish, the next parish, a dedication of a church, a confirmation, on and on and on and on. <clears throat> you know, and, and one of the things that they're, they're on <laughs> what you might call the rubber chicken circuit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the bishop would say, well, every place I go, you know, they feed you. They feel obliged to give you the best meal you've ever had in your life. And when I traveled a lot, I was doing 40 or so missions a year, I, I know. I was, I, I was never home. I was always a guest, and, and I was always at the opposite end of hospitality and a good meal, and it's wonderful because people, people are kind, but wow, the poor guy, you know, they, 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 they just, it's a form of sacrifice. Really, it is, um, and you've got to love them. You have to love legitimate authority in the church. Look, sometimes your pastor, now I know there are people sitting in here right now, and, and I'm, I'm not criticizing you, but I know some of you have pastors 
that may be less than what you want. Okay? You may have pastors that, that, that are problematic in this way or that. It can even happen that, that they drift off into immorality of one sort or another. I remember once I was very, very upset about a certain bishop. And I, I went to my superior in the church and I said, Father, but I, you know, he said this and he's doing that. And, and you know, I said... And he said, instead of criticizing him, why don't you suffer for him? Instead of criticizing him, why don't you offer reparation for him? Pray for him. Talk is cheap, easy to criticize. Hard to do anything about it. Humility will capacitate you to be obedient, and that leads to life. I return to that theme, that dynamism, that prototype over and over and over again. The Holy Spirit is given to those that obey. You can't obey day in and day out without humility. So cultivate it. <laughs> I remember couple of incidents uh, early in my formation, uh, one in, in novitiate. I, I was, I was uh, given a gift for philosophy and theology. Uh, trust me, I can't do most things in life. I am absolutely useless when it comes to mechanical ability, uh, mathematical or scientific ability, I am truly helpless. But I have a gift for philosophy and theology. And I had it from, from the beginning of my reconversion to the faith. Uh, it's a two-edged sword. I really had an aptitude. I grasped philosophy and theology instantly. Remember this, knowledge or giftedness without commensurate virtue is a train wreck waiting to happen. If you have giftedness, if you have knowledge, you have to have commensurate virtue or you're going to make a mess out of everything. I remember in the beginning, uh, I, I knew things in philosophy and theology. I learned almost all my theology before I ever went to the seminary. When I set foot in the seminary, and I went to a good seminary, I knew almost all of it because God gave me a gift. I, I studied, I read, I understood. Some, in, in many cases, more than my professors. In, in some cases, that wasn't hard. I remember a scripture class one time. We walked in, and we already, we already had this guy pegged. And uh, I, I, one of my classmates, some of you know him, is Fa Father Bill Casey from the Fathers of Mercy. He's been on EWTN. He was one of my best friends in, in the seminary. And I was sitting between Father Bill and another one of his uh, brother seminarians from the Fathers of Mercy. And we were in a scripture class, and this um, particular teacher had been ed educated on the West Coast at um, Berserkley. <laughs> Berkeley. A very liberal institution of so-called higher learning. And one day this professor came in, and as I said, we already had him pegged. We knew that the, he had a few loose nuts and bolts. And he announced at the beginning of class, today, gentlemen, I am going to explain to you the manna in the desert. And we, we, I remember thinking, great. And it began like this. Contemporary scholarship, the results of archaeological studies and philology, study of language, has now revealed to us what the manna in the desert actually was. 
and we all waited with bated breath. And he said, and I, I'm, I, I can't make this up, really. The manna in the desert was ant dung from a species of carpenter ant that inhabited the Judean desert. And I began to come out of my seat like an MX missile. And the two fathers of mercy physically restrained me. Ant dung? Are you crazy? What does that do for the biblical type of the Holy Eucharist? I, he didn't do it on purpose, and he didn't make it up. He actually read some articles by so-called biblical scholars that deduced that. Uh, you see, there's a crisis of method. They don't understand divine revelation. And, and they were using purely Protestant hermeneutics. You can't do that in the Catholic Church. Three principles for reading the written word of God. You have to read it as a totality. You can't take it out of context. Otherwise, you can justify anything with the Bible, including murder. Right? An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Nah, -uh, that's not what it means. Read it as a totality. Number two, you have to read it in the light of sacred tradition. These guys don't even believe in sacred tradition, and I'm not sure if they know what it means. Some of them. And third, you have to read the written word of God, applying what we call the analogy of the faith. Those are the three essential principles for the interpretation of sacred scripture. This guy had a doctorate in scripture from Berkeley and was clueless. He was arrogant and he was disobedient and he was dead, absolutely dead. And I'm gonna tell you something, here's a principle for you. Dead things transmit life to no thing. And that goes a long way toward explaining some of what's going on in the church with vocations and some religious congregations. Dead things, dead people, transmit life to no one. And so if they're dead, how do they transmit life? They don't. If the theologian or the pastor is dead, how does he transmit life to his people? He doesn't. How do he get dead? Pride, disobedience, death. Very simple. Don't let that go over your head. Don't let it go in one ear and out the other, and don't think it can't happen to you and me. It can. Cultivate humility that will capacitate you, empower you to be obedient, and then you'll live forever. The Catechism of the Catholic Church defines obedience and says it's comprised of three essential and interconnected elements, kind of like the Trinity, right? One God, three divine persons. Wherever one person of the Trinity is, there the other two absolutely must be. Kind of like divine revelation, which reflects the Trinity. Divine revelation is the revelation of the one God through three interconnected, compenetrated vehicles or condu conduits, sacred tradition, sacred scripture, magisterial teaching, no one of which can subsist without the other two. Well, obedience has three elements, according to the church. First, the submission to the authority of God, which requires everyone to obey the divine law. Obedience to the church is required in those things which per pertain to our salvation. And obedience is due also to legitimate civil authority. Now look, don't be confused. It doesn't mean you have to obey 
intrinsically illicit, immoral laws. You have a positive moral obligation to resist that. But I'm talking in general, you, you need to obey legitimate civil authority. That's what the church says. This is number 2216 in the catechism. Uh, this, even the civil authority has its origin in God. Um, and also say parents. They're, they're, your authority is from God. Don't be duped, hoodwinked, by a sick society, which would strip you of your intrinsic parental obligations and rights. <clears throat> I remember, a, well, really, you know, you know, I remember a mom coming to me and she said, "Oh, you know, my my son is a 15, and you, you know what happens when you get 15. You know, now now you're a man, woman of the world, having." acquired all worldly wisdom. You know everything. Hence, no one can tell you anything. So, you know, I was like that too. And, and you try to reason with them, and they won't listen. In the end, I got to tell you, you, you know, you, you, your hat that says mom, or dad, blink your eye and you'll see that it says boss. Or you're a chump. In plain English, you are the boss. And if you walk away from your parental responsibility and authority, you might get what you deserve. Don't willingly give up your responsibility and your authority to your children. I remember my mother, you know, I was somewhat, now in my, it wasn't so bad when I was a kid, I mean, but, you know, we were rebellious. I grew up in the 60s. I graduated from high school in 1965. So, you know, that was the I gotta be me. You know, I gotta be free, I gotta be me generation. And of course I knew everything. My mother couldn't tell me anything, but it didn't make a bit of difference. My mother was fearless. But th by the time I was 14 years old, I could bench press 300 pounds. And my mother was about five foot four. She had to give up hitting me with her hand. And that's when she acquired proficiency in household weapons. <laughs> you know, brooms wooden spoons, whatever. I remember one time she said, I came home late, I lied. I, I was about 17, 18, and uh, I, I, I said that uh, I, I'm gonna stay with my friend Moose tonight. We're gonna stay out at a party, and, but you know, I, I'm gonna just stay at Moose's house tonight. Well, I had her car. And um, I wasn't with Moose. She called Moose's house because she had to go to church Sunday morning. And her car was with me. And I wasn't with Moose. I came wandering in around noon. Wow. I immediately became an endangered species. <laughs> My mother said to me after she had finished throwing things, beating me with the broom, I was hiding under the table. Now, I, I, I was about, I was 17 or 18, playing football, lifting weights, I was hiding under the table while my little mother was hunting me down with all the household weapons. And finally, when she calmed down, she said, doesn't your conscience bother you? And I honestly said, no. You know why? I had killed my conscience. 
disobedience. You know, I lied to my mother. I used to sneak off Sunday morning, starting when I was about 15. Now, you're going to Mass? Yes, Mom. I'm going to the 10 o'clock Mass. And she always went to the earliest one. Okay, make sure. I will. And then I'd sneak off to the pool hall and shoot pool for money on Sunday morning. So that's a sin. You can't do that. So gradually, you numb your conscience. And ultimately, you kill your conscience. And, and then you can start doing the most unbelievably immoral things, and it doesn't bother you a bit. Doesn't your conscience bother you? Doesn't bother me a bit. Why not? It's dead. It's dead. Disobedience. Death. And I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But I had to find out the hard way. I remember lying in the, in the street in Los Angeles, drug addicted, homeless and penniless. I remember it distinctly. I remember the moment the thought came to me, you should have been obedient in little things. Because if you're obedient in little things, faithful in little things, then you're capacitated to be obedient and faithful in bigger things. So number one, the submission of authority. That's the one facet of obedience. You must submit to legitimate church authority, even legitimate civil authority. It doesn't mean you have to obey intrinsically illicit, immoral laws. You can resist that, and you should. You, ha you have an obligation. That's number one. Number two, the obedience of faith. The first obedience the church teaches us is that of faith, to listen and freely submit to the word of God. It, it, it comes from a word, obedience, comes from a word in Latin, two words, ob audere. We hear and we're obedient to what we hear. Catechesis is from a Greek word, a, ver a verb, a Greek verb, katekeo. And the, the substance of the meaning is to echo back faithfully. Catechesis is to echo back faithfully what we have heard, the authentic teaching of the church. We're obedient to that. We receive it. Uh, who do we receive it from? Well, we receive it from the magisterium of the church. And, and what's that? Well, the, that's the successors of the apostles, the bishops. In union with the Bishop of Rome, echoing back faithfully what they have received throughout the ages under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the authentic faith, in other words. So the obedience of faith. Third, the obedience of Christ. Jesus Christ substituted his obedience to the will of the Father, even unto death. For the disobedience of sin, that's the antithesis of the obedience of Jesus. Fourth, we, we have a vow of obedience, you know, uh, in imitation of the obedience of Jesus. Uh, we have a, a vow of obedience uh, that religious take. Uh, it's an evangelical council, as we call it. Uh, priests uh, vow to be obedient to their superior, their bishop, religious superior. The faithful can profess a vow of obedience, a public vow of obedience accepted by church authority. It, con it, 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 in, it illustrates or characterizes consecrated life. In a, in a certain sense, of course, married people exchange vows. In a sense, there's an obedience in marriage but it's not what's uh, often translated, um, <laughs> you know, wives um, be submissive 
to your husbands, a better translation is husbands and wives be mutually submissive to each other, in other words, out of love for God, imitating the love of, of Christ for his church and the church for Christ. There, there's a mutual respect, a mutual obedience. Without it, there's no life. We've had a lot of disobedience in recent years. I, I, I think I mentioned uh, at, at one point the infamous Winnipeg statement. Um, there are many people uh, from Canada here. Um, you know, I remember I went to Canada with my family every summer. It was like a pilgrimage. Um, we, we went to, uh, in Quebec mostly, all, all the pilgrimage places, you know, St. Anne de Beaupre, uh, St. Joseph's Oratory. Um, uh, Canadian people, in, in, in French-speaking Canada, it, it might have been the most rigorous faith in the Catholic Church at one time. And it seemed like overnight they self-destructed. Disobedience to church authority. Uh, I've seen it in this country, you know, I, uh, ever since my reconversion to the faith, I, I've, um, I, I think I've been uh, I've somewhat over the years tempered, but I, I, I still can, I can't hardly stay in a room with a dissident, disobedient priest or religious. I can't hardly stand it. There's a story about the Apostle St. John when he was in Ephesus. He, he was at, at, at the public baths, Roman institution, and presumably in the other side of the place, a heretic came in. And reportedly, St. John, the, you know, the disciple of love, Right? The one who said God is love, the beloved disciple. St. John reportedly leaped to his feet and said, Run for your lives! The heretic so-and-so has just entered the building. And that was his attitude. Dissent, disobedience, the kiss of death. The absolute kiss of death. How we've let it go on, I don't know. You know, someone at lunch asked me, uh, Father, how do we, how do they put up with it? Why don't we hear more from the pulpit about some of the outrages in society? And they mentioned Notre Dame. You know, I was there that Sunday, not too long ago, on the other side of the campus. Good Catholics marvel at that. You know, how, how can we do this? How can they allow that? It was no surprise to me. Forty years of it, you know? I don't like to mention names. You know, University of Notre Dame is a fantastic Catholic institution, has been maybe the most prestigious Catholic university in the country. But honestly, you know, people have asked me many times, well, I, I, I want to send my, my kids to Notre Dame. Yeah, well, and for one thing, it's going to cost you over 100000 for a four-year education. But fine, if you have it, you know, great. Uh, fine, they have some good programs at Notre Dame. They, they basically have a chapel still in every dorm, mass, a lot of good things at Notre Dame. And I always tell them, at least I used to, fine, if they go to Notre Dame, make darn sure they don't go anywhere near the theology department. <laughs> Another prestigious Jesuit, the Notre Dame, not a Jesuit institution, but, you know, Georgetown is. Remember, not too long ago, they, they hid all the religious symbols? Can you imagine? Someone, a dignitary, president, whatever, comes to a Catholic institution and you hide 
all the crucifixes or statues of the Blessed Mother. You just get them out of sight. I would like to see the White House or anybody else tell me to get the religion symbols out of my house. You want to see some real sport, watch that. But it goes on. It has gone on. Why? Pride, disobedience, death. The Holy Spirit is given to those that obey, not to those that disobey. The, the operative word is assent. We have a positive moral obligation to give the assent of faith to church teaching. Not, not dissent, you know, for it was, it was uh, fashionable, de rigueur, to be a dissenter for a while in the church. Not so fashionable anymore. Ever since the days of Pope John Paul the Great, he, he did a lot, almost single-handedly, to reverse that movement. Uh, he made holiness, again, something to, to, to be desired. He was a true scholar and a saint. No question. I was at his funeral. And I'll tell you something. If anyone ever had any doubts that this man was a saint, you should have been there at his funeral for the few days surrounding his funeral. I mean, uh, Raymond Arroyo and I, Ray Raymond did a, a constant broadcast um, from the roof of the North American College. And I was with him one evening. And we went up. They had a scaffolding metal scaffolding set on top of the North American College, on the roof. Um, <laughs> that was, they, they could look down on the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. Uh, it was magnificent. Uh, it, it was kind of um, a problem, though, because all the, most of the cardinals and bishops they had scheduled to interview, uh, they were dressed in cassocks, and they were older people, and, and they took one look at that scaffolding that went up on top of the roof, and, and they weren't going up there. But I remember being up there, and we broadcast, it was sunset, just about sunset. And the sun was setting blood red over the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. There were a million people in front of us in the street. Helicopters, gunships, were flying wide tactical circles around the area. Patriot missile batteries were in the hills above Rome. Unbelievable peace. You could feel it. There wasn't any crime that week in Rome. And there's usually plenty of it. Absolute peace reigned, and I knew, I knew it before, but I knew at that moment that this was a saint. And if you think back on it, you remember what it was like. It's almost as if God forced the world to pay tribute to John Paul II. You remember that? The, 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 the news media, everything else was suspended. They were focused on this great man's life and his death. His teaching uh, on human sexuality, the theology of the body, his teaching uh, on, on the Holy Spirit, on the church, his teaching on the meaning of Christian suffering. I wrote my doctoral thesis in dogmatic theology on the theology of the cross or the theology of suffering in the teaching of Pope John Paul II. That was my doctoral thesis. Magnificent theology. And I studied it three years, day and night. Wrote my thesis, successfully defended it. And John Paul was the Pope that I knew best. You know, most of my adult life, he was the Holy Father. He ordained me in 1991 at St. Peter's Basilica.
the essence, the essence of that teaching on the mystery of Christian suffering was that it's the power of the Holy Spirit that sets us on fire and enables us to do great and heroic things for Christ, for the church, for the truth. You are called to this. No matter how little you are, no matter how great you are, whether you're a priest, a religious, mom, dad, whatever, you're called to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're called to embrace a cross. No way out. Believe me, I've been looking. And if I had found one, I would use this occasion to tell you about it. No pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no gall, no glory. No heroic effort, no fierce battle, no medal of honor. You'll blink your eye and we'll be out of here. So be open to the power of the Holy Spirit. And remember this, if you are, that'll be proven by the degree of humility you have. That'll enable you to obey, and that will lead to life. Don't be a dissident. Give the assent of faith. Be faithful in season, out of season, convenient, inconvenient. Do this, and I'm going to tell you something. In the days to come, mark my words, I tell you this without any fear of error. In the very near future, we will have more than ample opportunity to display, to exhibit, to live heroic virtue. Do it. The Holy Spirit is given to those that obey. Be obedient, run toward the finish line, and then I'll see you in heaven. God love you. I just remembered something. I was asked to, at this point, give you a blessing. Uh, so we don't forget later, okay? So um, the Lord be with you. I place each one of you in the enclosed garden of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I entrust you to the care of St. Michael and all the holy angels. I ask that God, the Father, bring you more deeply into the life of his Son. That the Holy Spirit fill you with his fire. That your mind be enlightened by truth your will strengthened in his will. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, we have one more round. We'll see you in a little while.